why not just send robots? Why do we need people there? What are they going to do? What about the biomedical issues? You've got radiation. You've got microgravity. Ah, what about the hardware? I mean, the Saturn V is long gone, and that's what we use to send Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to the moon. And can you make this affordable? Is it going to take the entire national budget, or could you do it within what NASA is already getting, plus maybe inflation? So in the past, I would raise these as big questions, maybe even showstoppers, but I think today I would give a very different answer. Let's talk about what people can do and what humans can do. So opportunity over the last 13, 14 years has driven uh, about 25 miles. It's made hundreds of measurements, but it cannot collect any rocks. By comparison, Apollo 17, the last Apollo mission, drove roughly the same distance in 20 hours, not 13 years, collected uh, about uh, 200 pounds of rocks and brought them back. Now, the difference in expense <laughs> was huge. You know, the Spirit and Opportunity cost about, I don't know, a billion and a half dollars. Mercury, Gemini, Apollo cost over a hundred billion dollars. Uh, in, you know, that was, of course, 50 years ago. But uh, what about the science results of that? Well, my friend Steve Squires, who is the uh, principal scientist for Spirit and Opportunity, has made the following statement. He said, it takes a rover a day to do what a field geologist could do in 45 seconds. So he did a test with a bunch of well-known Mars scientists, had them, uh, when he clicked the stopwatch, go out, collect a rock, and tell them what it was. And they could do that in under a minute. It takes a rover all day to do that. So if you had people there, they could be very efficient, very effective in making observations and figuring out where the best place is to go and look for the fingerprints of life. But what about all those radiation effects and microgravity and all that stuff? You're in weightlessness, traveling to Mars, exposed to the environment for seven months or so. Well, this was now um, just about four years ago. The chief medical officer for NASA, Rich Williams, made the following statement. He said, there are no crew health risks at this time that are considered mission stoppers for humans to Mars. That's a very bold statement, and we can talk about it in a little bit if you want to. But what he's saying is we have learned enough about how people react and the countermeasures to that that he felt, as the chief medical officer, safe in saying it was now acceptable risk, this is all about acceptable risk, to send humans to Mars. Okay, that's the second item. New space hardware. NASA is building something called a space launch system. Be roughly a Saturn V replacement um, and a deep space capsule called Orion. Uh, in addition to that, the uh, commercial crew flights will start this year sometime. Now, full disclosure, I serve as the chairman of the commercial crew safety advisory panel for SpaceX. So I'm going to show you a bunch of SpaceX stuff that they've uh, let me use. And uh, I think it's very compelling about what one entrepreneur has been able to achieve. Uh, the commercial cargo program that's underway has been highly successful. And the reason you do this is this. If you were to build Elon Musk's Falcon 9 and Dragon capsule using standard government procurement procedures, it would cost you, on the left, about $4 billion. Elon Musk put about $400 million in. NASA put about $400 million in. And for less than a billion dollars, the U.S. now has an entrepreneur providing a whole new launch vehicle and a whole new space capsule. That's the power of what can happen once the investment is done in the advanced technology and then an entrepreneur takes that and goes to the next step and turns it in almost to a production line. So I think for NASA, if you used all the things I just described, <clears throat> the hardware that's currently being developed, the savings from groups like SpaceX and Boeing, developed only the new stuff you absolutely need, my view, use the moon only for intermediate testing, not as a, a base. And you broke the program into two pieces. First, learn how to get to Mars in orbit and then land. Um, and you took the money from supporting the space station 
and you backed away from that in 2024 or 2028, then using just the money that NASA has for its human spaceflight program today, with inflation, you could orbit Mars with people in about uh, 14 years from now and land them in 2039. I do believe that this is possible, and I think the risk factors have all come down significantly. So that's, that's a pretty uh, ambitious goal. I think it's doable. We can talk a little bit more, if you want, about what are the political obstacles. But let me just make the point that NASA, as I said, is not the only game in town today. SpaceX has their own vision for getting people to Mars. Uh, what SpaceX is trying to do is to get a greater overlap between people who want to go and people who can afford to go. And to do that, SpaceX, and Elon Musk in particular, has said he wants to get the cost of going to Mars one way. <laughs> yeah, you got to put that in, right? Yeah. Before you sign up, <laughs> at about $140,000. That's within the realm of at least some uh, extreme adventure types. Um, to do that, uh, and to actually build a settlement, I mean, when pressed, uh, Elon will say, yes, yes, we will provide you with a ticket home if you want to come back. Uh, he says, these four things are absolutely necessary to building an affordable Mars settlement. Full reusability, refilling in orbit, and then uh, a bunch of chemistry about the right propellant. Um, so to do that, he has put forward in public what he calls his BFR, which he says stands for the Big Falcon Rocket. <laughs> uh, he, there might be other words, but <laughs> we'll just say it's the Big Falcon Rocket, all right? And this thing is a monster. Uh, you're talking about 40 cabins with a huge pressurized volume, uh, gigantic fuel tanks with uh, both uh, methane and uh, liquid oxygen. It chooses those because you could make those on Mars with what we already know is there. Uh, and then, you know, sophisticated engines and so forth. I'll let this run just a little bit more so you can see part of the dream here or part of the engineering plan, which is refilling it from a, a drone spacecraft in orbit. And you see how the transfer of methane and oxygen would occur. The rocket itself is way over on the right. It would have more capability than the Saturn V. 150 metric tons to low Earth orbit. That's gigantic. Um, and the goals, I mean, this is what, I mean, Elon himself admits that he is guilty of uh, aspirational goals, he calls them. But he said he would like to send an unmanned version in 2022 and send people in 2024. Now, in the past, his predictions have slipped, but I think it's a, a noteworthy goal to lay out there to push the whole system. <clears throat> so this next piece here, um, you might be able to see by streaming, but uh, SpaceX has given me, allowed me to take a copy of it so I can show it to you here on the ship. This is the launch uh, of the Falcon 9 Heavy, including its very special payload, uh, which is, you'll, you will see Starman in a Tesla Roadster, uh, and part of the other engineering dream, which is to show reusability. Okay, here we go. It's a god-awful small affair To the girl with the mousy hair But her mummy is yelling no her daddy has told her to go But her friend is nowhere to be seen Now she walks through her sunken dream To the seat with the clearest view And she's hooked to the silver screen But the film is a sad thing for For she's lived it ten times or more She could spit in the eyes of fools as they ask her to focus on sailors Fighting in the dance hall Oh man, look at those gay men go It's the freaking show Take a look at the low man Beating up the wrong guy Oh man, wonder if you'll ever know Who's in 
Birds. Is there life on Mars? This isn't computer graphics, folks. This is real. All right, watch this. Watch this. This is unbelievable. Two first stages coming down simultaneously. Wow. Made on Earth by humans. Starman and his Tesla Red Roadster are now circling an orbit roughly the same as that of Mars around the sun, and will be for millions of years. So what do we do? Well, we put all this together. Where we are today is that Mars is on the surface, dry, apparently dead, but we know from all of this huge amount of scientific data that in the past it had abundant liquid water on the surface, and we know that it's still there in the form of water ice, that there may be liquid lakes, maybe life migrated to that if it formed on the surface. So in the future, can we do this? Can we go? Can we build a base? Can we live there? Can we explore? Can we look for life? My friends, I think we can do this. Thank you. So we've got 10-15 uh, minutes. I'd be happy to take some questions. Do you know the pressure and or temperature of the liquid water you found? All we really know is that the reflections of the radio waves, of the radar, uh, when they've been polarized, and I won't get into all the technical detail, but when they've been modified and come back, indicate a reflection surface that's got what's called the dielectric. It's got the characteristics of liquid water. A friend of mine, I'm not an expert in um, this type of radar measurement, but I have a friend, uh, Charles Elashi, who was the director of the Jet Propulsion Lab, who is, um, and uh, he said he'd seen the raw data, and he thinks beyond a doubt that they have found a liquid water lake. Uh, now, it would have to be to be liquid, and that place, a kilometer below the surface, it would probably be very, very briny, which case it has suppressed, uh, depressed the, uh, the melting point, the freezing point. And so you have a situation where, uh, you know, the, mo the water is probably less than 32 Fahrenheit, you know, zero degrees, uh, but is not frozen because of the presence of all these salts. But we don't know that. That's just sort of um, extrapolation from the measurement we do have. The thought of uh, dwellings at first, is it to burrow into cliffs and to avoid radiation and what's involved with, with hardware to bur burrow into the, into the rock and, and tunnel out? And, or is it still safe enough to just build these bubbles on the surface where radiation comes right in? What's the kind of the calculation on that kind of thing? Yeah, if you were going to have a safe habitat on the surface of Mars, even though Mars has an atmosphere, the moon does not. So if you're going to build a, uh, a habitat on the moon, it would have to be even more resistant to radiation. Mars has an atmosphere that does filter out some of the radiation, but you would almost inevitably, if not be below grade, you would use some of what's called the regolith, some of the dirt and rocks of Mars to cover your habitat in order to shield it. Uh, it would also have to be one that had a vacuum seal of some sort because the atmosphere, even though it exists, is very, very thin. It's like Earth at 100,000 feet. And so uh, you would need to live inside of a pressurized module as well. And there are a lot of complications that would have to be dealt with, like the dust and so forth. But I think it's pretty safe to say that you are going to, uh, to have uh, either be underground or build something on the surface and then pile a lot of... Mars rock and dirt on top of it. Yeah, you need to send robotic diggers, and you know I'm sure that that you know Caterpillar or somebody is working on a proposal right now. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. I un if I understood correctly, um, next year you're la we're launching a probe that's looking to bring back rocks from the surface of Mars. Is that so, that, so in 2020, it, the first part of a three-part mission okay. will get launched. And this is the rover that will have the ability to drill out cores and put them in canisters and save them 
for another mission that will come and pick them up and then take them back. Do we know how that's going to happen yet? <laughs> yeah, yeah get, they're, Physically get them back, you know, all the way back to Earth. Yeah, no, so the first step is to uh, select these samples, very carefully selected samples using the best science we can, put them in sealed canisters, and then position those canisters so they can be easily found. Then another mission, I didn't get into this because of time constraints, would go and land on the surface, and then probably, this is one architecture, have what's called a fetch rover that would go out and grab the samples and bring it back to a waiting rocket. So now comes the really interesting and tricky part of the whole mission, is to load those samples into the nose cone of a rocket that would launch from the surface of Mars and rendezvous with a waiting orbiter. Okay, and then that waiting orbiter would turn around and return to Earth. And so it takes all three parts to make this work. It's a very daunting engineering challenge, and that's why it hasn't been done up to now. But I think that the uh, risks and issues are well understood, and now it's a matter of, of doing the development. Other questions? Yes, sir. Or yes, ma'am, over here. And then we'll come to you. Yeah, so the question is, what's the global participation in all these projects? Um, science exploration has always been international. Uh, we've flown U.S. instruments on European missions and vice versa for 50 years or more. There are currently a couple of international missions orbiting Mars. I mean, no one has successfully landed on Mars and conducted all the science that the U.S. has, but both India um, and uh, the European Space Agency uh, currently have missions that are in orbit around Mars. And I expect that sort of collaboration to continue. Um, in terms of...